Yeah, sounds like it's working. Great. Hello, welcome. How is everybody? It's a nice turnout. Okay, good. Thank you for responding. That's great. So my name is Sarah Jaquette Ray. I'm a professor of English here and coordinator of the Geography and Environmental Studies program at UAS. And it's my pleasure to welcome Carson Hoyer and his wife, Leanne Allison, who will be talking tonight. So welcome to the final evening at Egan Lecture of the Year. I want to thank everybody, all the presenters and the people who have attended the, the lectures this whole season for a very successful series this year. This is the final event, and uh, we're lucky to have the, the speakers, the, the author and the filmmaker for our One Campus, One Book selection. I want to also mention that we'll be selling, Sarah Hagen is in the back there, if you haven't got a chance to pick up a book of Bean Caribou is being sold back there, and she'll be here for the rest of the night. And um, also the, the sound and motion series that's starting in the spring starts up in January, so keep your eye out for that too. So tonight's talk is by Carson Hoyer, author of Bean Caribou, Five Months on Foot with an Arctic Herd. The book is about Carson and his wife Leanne's incredible journey following the porcupine herd to its cabin ground from northern Yukon Territory to the coastal plains of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. They embark on this crazy adventure that I would not do, but I'm glad somebody did it, in order to tell the story of the migration from the caribou's perspective. In doing so, they fill a silence in debates about oil exploration in Anwar, in which the voices of ecosystems, landscapes, caribou, not to mention mosquitoes, grizzly bears, and spirits, have no place. Being Caribou's UAS's selection for the One Campus, One Book program. This program seeks to create community across campus and through the community, through a common reading. 11 faculty are using this book in their classes, and more than 200 students have read the book. From the freshman core class that is not here of 120 students because they're out watching Eagles in Haines, which is great too, to composition classes, science classes, and outdoor studies classes. Add the community members and the staff across the campus who keep telling me how much they love this book, and my impression is that the intent of the program has exceeded expectations this year, thanks to the quality and message of Carson and Leanne's work. I want to thank those students, faculty, and staff for participating in the conversation and helping to welcome Carson and Leanne. And thanks to Chancellor Pugh and his staff for supporting One Campus, One Book, as well as the committee that put together this election Joe Nelson, Jill Dumasnell, Ernestine Hayes, Julie, Julie Stavlin, Carol Hedlund, and Wendy Gervin for all their work to make, uh, in making the program possible. Faculty and staff interested in being on the selection committee next year can just talk to me. Sorry for the shameless plug there, but we need people on the committee to do this. I have enjoyed hearing the campus's reactions to this book, but the most significant message to me are the ones that resonate with my own reason for being a teacher. I want to quickly share some of these with you, as I think it will give you a sense of uh, the, three, the three days of their intense visit here, which they de deserve a break from for sure. First, they have talked a lot about how making the world a better place is a long process that happens from the ground up, not from the top down, as the experience that they had in DC after being caribou shows us. So many of our students come to UAS, learn that the world is really messed up, and wonder how, much less if, they'll ever be able to make a difference. It can be disheartening, and Carson and Leanne have been giving students faith in their futures and empowering them to see themselves as agents of change. Relatedly, they talk a lot about passion. Pursuing one's passion is far more likely to lead to a life that is fulfilling, albeit neither easy nor lucrative, than other motivations like money or fear of failure. In a world dominated by market-driven definitions of success, with words like outcomes, deliverables, results, which I'm allergic to. Uh, this is increasingly uh, corrupting higher education as well. The value of the journey gets lost, and students need reminding of, of this more than ever. Embracing the messiness of the learning process, the role of struggle in achievement, the pleasure in discovering what happens when you lose the trail, are crucial skills for success in this world and the corporate model of higher education will discourage students from following the whiny paths of activism and social change that Carson and Land have pursued. Indeed, their visit has been inspiring, a reminder of what we can achieve, and I'm so grateful for what they have already shared with us. So, who is Carson Hoyer? Carson and his wife, Leanne, and their eight-year-old son, Zev, who's here, live in Canmore outside Calgary, Alberta, Canada. 
Carson is an avid adventurer, photographer, author, author, and park warden. He and his wife are, as described on the website, quote, a storytelling and adventure team who work on pressing conservation issues in compelling and creative ways. Storytelling, especially from the perspectives of animals, is a trademark of their work because they believe it is the most effective way to get people to care. Indeed, in their time here, they've talked a lot about empathy and the importance of empathy in all work. Being Caribou is a book about the second of three adventures that Carson and Leanne call necessary journeys, journeys that aren't just about adrenaline and triumph, but which have political and activist goals. The book has won numerous awards. It won the grand prize at Banff International Mountain Book Festival in 2005. In 2006, it was Globe and Mail's top 100 books and uh, the US National Outdoor Book of the Year. It was honored as the best travel book by independent publishers also that year and earned the Sigurd Olson Nature Writing Award in 2007. Carson's also published a children's version of this book. And Leanne's film, Being Caribou, which we screened publicly last night, is a, a whole enterprise and achievement of its own. The book and film have been central to many organizations' campaigns to raise awareness about drilling in Anwar, demonstrating the impact of telling stories, providing images, and evoking empathy for activist efforts. I would even take it a step further and say that Carson Leanne's work proves that the arts, writing, filmmaking, telling stories, have a major role to play in real political change. What are Carson Leanne up to these days, you might want to ask. I urge you to ask them that. It's a little bit cryptic. Besides catching up with Randall Tetlici and Whitehorse, who was our last week's speaker, if anyone came to that, he's in the book and he'll be featured, I'm sure, in, in their slides here. Um, and dragging their wonderful son to college classes to hear his parents talk. Carson is leaving 18 years of a career as a seasonal park warden to become president of a nonprofit transnational conservation organization called Yellowstone to Yukon. So certainly look into that. It's a shift, an interesting shift, I think. Meanwhile, Leanne has just finished a, multi, a new multimedia interactive film project called Bear 71, which they'll talk about today. And I strongly urge you to take the 20 minutes of your life that it takes to watch this and interact with it. It's really interesting. Their website tells us that they are hoping to start a new necessary journey in 2014. So perhaps you can squeeze out of them what that will be. As you'll see, Carson and Leanne are certainly a force moving as if motivated by a deep instinct with great purpose and endurance in all they do. And I'm honored to observe them in our habitat for a few days. Thank you so much for coming to Juno, Carson, and Leanne, and please help me welcome them. Thanks a lot. Um, how we thought we'd do the evening was I would uh, kind of do the lion's share of the presentation and then near the end, Leanne's gonna come up and talk a little bit about Bear 71. And I think at the end, we were thinking of opening it up to questions, at which we'll have a, a, a runner uh, going around with another mic we have uh, because the whole evening's being recorded to make sure everything gets documented. Uh, it's been great being here. Uh, I, we kind of had a luncheon with, uh, a potluck luncheon with faculty and staff today. And there was a, a number of great questions. One of them was, uh, you know, what, have the, what has this place taught you? since you've been here. And I think, uh, I mean, it, I've been, our whole family's been taught a lot of things, but I think one of the major things that we've been taught or reminded of being here is just how important scale is uh, in an environment for learning and for living. And I think the UAS campus has really got the scale right. Um, there is, a, it, it's not too big, it's not too small. There's a very sort of human scale to, to, to being here that makes it friendly, it makes it familiar. Uh, the, the word I used to kind of describe it at lunch today was tribal. It's, we, we, we can have interrelationships uh, between the learners and the, and, the, and the people doing the teaching that uh, are not just kind of in the lecture halls but spill over into everyday life and even into the community as well. So congratulations on that and I would really say uh, cherish that and be cognizant of that in the years ahead as uh, no doubt there's going to be pressures to, to change and expand and how you nurture that into the future is I think really important. So uh, I, I see a lot of 
faces in the crowd who were uh, here last night to see Being Caribou. There's a few students in the crowd who uh, I've already uh, spoke, Leanne and I have spoken with uh, at many, many classes over the last three days. So what we thought we'd talk about tonight was not just Being Caribou, but really all our journeys, our necessary journeys, and what our time out on the land has taught us, a kind of wisdom that we've uh, been privy to, if you will, uh, just through these these many, many months long trips. And, and so the first one I'm going to be talking about tonight is a trip we did in 1998 and 1999, walking 3,400 kilometers from Yellowstone all the way up to the Yukon. And that was to highlight the need for wildlife corridors for wide ranging species like bears, wolves, wolverines, all the science showing us that these animals actually need much more land than any one of our protected areas provide on their own. The, the second trip is gonna be being caribou, uh, five months out with a porcupine caribou herd, which was sort of specifically our intent was to highlight the decades old debate about whether or not to develop the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge uh, from, but to talk about it from the perspective of the animals that, themselves. And then the third journey was, uh, was born out of that. We canoed and sailed for five months right from our home in Canmore, Alberta, in the Rocky Mountains to the home of Farley Mowat, uh, many of whom you might know, a great childhood hero of both of ours. And we exchanged letters with him along the way as we traveled through the settings of his stories to finally meet him in person. And then Leanne is going to talk a little bit at the end about uh, this Bear 71, which is a really interesting project that explores uh, the 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 sort of techno technological world and how it kind of both distances us and brings us closer to nature uh, through a lot of remote camera imagery that's being used for wildlife research in the valley where we live in Banff National Park, uh, in Banff National Park and the surrounding area. And really what we're going to be talking about tonight is not just what we've learned on the trips, but what we've absorbed through the process of creating and crafting stories out of those journeys. And, and, and this is something that I find so valuable as a writer is that to have the privilege to digest what actually happened and to draw the meaning out of it before just kind of jumping on to the next thing. And so a lot of the, 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 the insights that you're gonna hear tonight are born out of those many, many hours and days spent thinking and sitting in front of a computer trying to hammer it out into something legible on paper. Uh, it's, it's been born out of our work in crafting uh, these these trips into films uh, with the National Film Board of Canada and then of course in this new realm for Leanne uh, on the most recent project uh, on the web. And, and where this story kind of continually starts from almost all these journeys is actually from my day job uh, during all these years which has been as a park ranger uh, in Banff National Park and I started this right out of university and, uh, and when I first started, one of my big jobs was to go out and try to figure out as a biologist on the landscape, and this is, you're looking down at the town of Banff here in the Rocky Mountains, and you can see it's, it's almost as rugged as the landscape right around here, and wildlife already funneled into the valley bottoms by the, by the extreme topography. You superimpose human development on that, usually in the valley bottoms, and all of a sudden they're getting squeezed. And we were wondering how much can you squeeze these animals before they're cut off in these wildlife corridors that they once had to move through an area become dead ends. Well, we actually figured that out a little bit. We figured out where dead ends were occurring. We actually proposed a number of things to open them up again. And as a biologist, this was so rewarding because we re actually removed some developments in certain parts around the town of Banff. And what happened was the very next year, the wolf use of those corridors increased by 700%. So it was just this immediate response on the part of the animals. And yet we knew uh, from some of the radio collared studies of some of these wolves, particularly this wolf, Pluey, who was fitted with a satellite transmitter on her collar, uh, we knew from the movements that Pluey showed us and others that just working on one valley alone was essentially meaningless to these animals that range so much farther. So uh, just to orient you on the, on the map here, Pluey was, uh, hang on here. Uh, I'm 
Louis was radio collared very close to the US Canada border. You see the dot that says Calgary there. So just to the west of that, where the yellow line starts, is where she was originally radio collared. She, over the next couple of years, she moved down uh, into northern Montana, so across the US Canada border, then over into northern Idaho, and then into west central BC, and then finally back into the Rockies movements that encompassed. I'm not very good at the imperial scale, 120,000 square kilometers or an area over 10 times the size of Yellowstone National Park, which is right in the lower right uh, area here in dark green. And, and immediately people were completely blown away by this. Uh, biologists, members of the public, anybody who is privy to this information. But it wasn't just Pluie telling us this really important story and message. There was another wolf that was radio collared right at the US-Canada border. Northern Glacier National Park in Montana, and that wolf moved to mile zero of the Alaska Highway, so a distance of over 500 miles if you measured it in a straight line. There was uh, another wolf that moved from very close to where we live in the Rockies, west of Calgary, to within just 100 miles of Yellowstone. And uh, there was a lynx in the late 1980s that moved over 600 miles straight line distance from the southeastern Yukon into central BC. There's bears that have moved from central BC out to the Pacific coast. And the list goes on. There was a fish, uh, a little bull trout that moved over 1,000 miles in the Prophet Liard and Slave River system uh, one year as well. And then, of course, we have this eagle migration happening up and down the Rockies every spring and every summer where we have over 6,000 golden eagles and 25 other species of raptors, including uh, bald eagles that are moving thousands of miles as well. And so all these things were showing us that our traditional way of approaching conservation, which has been to you know, draw a line around a specific area, whether it's you know, the St. Elias or Wrangell, or whether it's Glacier Bay, or whether it's any of these Banff or Yellowstone parks in the Rockies, was insufficient. This is not how nature is viewing the landscape. And so this new idea started to be, bo be born, uh, which is called Yellowstone to Yukon, of having a network of reserves so that collectively, if you make sure the links that in most cases still exist between these are designated and conserved into the future, then collectively these reserves will achieve together what they can't achieve on their own in terms of long-term places where these wildlife can move and respond and escape and recolonize in response to things like f f massive forest fires, outbreaks of disease, and not insignific insignificantly climate change. And so when I first heard about this, working as a park ranger and having worked on these wildlife corridors locally, I was enthralled. I mean, Pluey was telling us this exact story, a way of looking at the landscape like this, a way of thinking much bigger was necessary. And yet I was doubtful, uh, quite frankly, of whether it could actually work. And so I got on the phone and called colleagues up and down the, the, the region and said, what do you think? Like this why to why idea, Yellowstone to Yukon, do you think it can actually happen on the ground? And the funny thing was, is we are all victims of our own jurisdictions, our own lines that we have drawn on the maps to, pol you know, the, the political boundaries in which we work and communicate with one another. And so here, the, the, you know, the, the, the biologists in Montana could tell me about what was going on in Montana, but they couldn't say much about what was going on right over the border in Alberta and BC. And so I couldn't get a full picture from anybody, and that's when we really decided, okay, it's time to sort of go out and figure this out for ourselves. So imagine traveling a line like a wolf or grizzly bear might move along the wildest route possible from Yellowstone to the Yukon and try to see what barriers did or didn't exist on the ground but also in the communities from a social and values perspective. And so we set off in 1998, and uh, it, was a, it was a one and a half year, 2,200 uh, mile long journey that we did on foot and skis, the first 600 miles on foot from Yellowstone. This is coming up through Glacier and Waterton, up over the Canadian border. Once we hit Banff, uh, we actually hopped on horses for 100 miles because we had a crew from National Geographic coming along with all their equipment and then continued to walk the next uh, 150 miles to Jasper, kind of waited for the snows to settle, and then took off again in the spring for the next 300 miles along the Continental Divide, traveling by ski, and then a little bit by canoe for a couple hundred miles down the Murray River, and then another 600 miles by foot across the wilds of northern BC and into the Yukon. 
uh, on foot. And what we learned on the journey, I guess what I learned was, you know, up until then I was sort of very much a, a textbook ecologist and a textbook uh, conservationist. And so, you know, issues to me had really been portrayed as pretty black and white. And, you know, much like this portrayal of, of the western boundary of Yellowstone where that boundary has basically, the foresters have worked right up to that boundary and it literally is a straight hard line that the animals encounter as soon as they hit the edges of the park. And, you know, at, at the time you're kind of like, that's terrible, that's wrong. Uh, and yet, as I was on the ground and I was going through some of these forestry operations and these landings and I was actually kind of inhaling the, the, the scents and the smells and the, and, the, and the sounds of, you know, this working landscape and meeting the, the people and their families that are dependent on it, the, that sort of black and white story started to change. There were faces, there were lives behind this issue. And, and yet, you know, I also kind of found some wiggle room or some opportunities within that gray realm. And a good example is, for instance, Brian Kelly here, small scale family owned logging operation that was operating right in one of these potentially great connections between Yellowstone and the Bob Marshall and Glacier Wilderness Complex in Northern Montana. Uh, but the conditions under which he was allowed to come in and do this small scale cut was that that digger would be the last piece of machinery to leave. And what that digger would be doing would be digging the road that he'd used to come in and access the area back to its original slope. And that road that had been there for over 30 years providing, providing motorized access. So really, you know, from the perspective of wildlife security and this corridor functioning over a long period of time, this particular forestry operation was probably of net benefit. Uh, Brian, Hil uh, Brian Hilger was another example in his 80s, a uh, rancher. He just had uh, put his 18,000 acre ranch into a conservation easement because not because he was so worried and concerned about its position, which was crucial in this uh, Yellowstone to Yukon idea in the Missouri Breaks region of northern Montana, but rather he was just concerned to see all the ranch lands around him being subdivided and developed into condominium complexes. And what he wanted was his sons and their sons to be able to still have the opportunity to ranch as he and his father and grandfather had. And so that was his motivation. And yet there is uh, massive benefits for keeping this landscape open for wildlife still to be, be able to move through as well. And then we were also going through and, and documenting some of the problems. You know, the, a lot of the roads in the region are getting busy enough that they are complete barriers for wildlife, huge sources of mortality. And yet we were able to also talk about some of the solutions, and this is right in the valley where we live, uh, 50 meter or 50 yard wide wildlife overpass. Uh, there's a whole system of these overpasses and underpasses during about a f uh, 50 mile length of highway, and there's been over 220,000 uh, passes by wildlife now since these things were built uh, over the last 15 years. So a tremendous kind of success story. We do have the power to mitigate some of our major uh, influences on the landscape as well. And so this was the sort of story that I was trying to portray as we hiked this region, as we brought alive the, the idea of Yellowstone to Yukon, and actually went into communities all along the route to talk to people. Uh, and, but, you know, there, it wasn't sort of as friendly a crowd uh, often as I'm looking out at tonight. And this was often sort of what stared back at me as I got up on, on stage in these community halls to talk about this idea of, of, of connecting wildlife into the future. And it demanded some you know, quick thinking, it demanded some creativity, it demanded a lot of experimentation, and it was sort of learn as you go uh, effective storytelling. You know, what did and didn't work? Uh, how did you find the common ground to start building up trust and the conversation from the ground up, what landed our trip on the front page of the newspapers versus somewhere buried in the back. And so we kind of became these, uh, you is sort of a, you know, into the fry pan type of learning for how to be effective storytellers, how to weave a compelling narrative. And what, what I learned is that, you know, people, kind of glass over often when you just start talking about the science alone and nothing else. 
And so we, we were quickly learning how to weave in the human side of the story. And so this element of traveling this entire region with my dog was a huge thing that would kind of warm people to the, the notions of this journey and uh, attaching it to the conservation initiative. You know, the, the, the sub story of starting with one girlfriend and ending with another was huge. <laughs> but the same dog, you'll notice. And, you know, there is an element of that book and that story that kind of became a love story as well. And we, we, we were quickly learning, you know, we are all humans. And we have to bring a human face to these, to these stories. It isn't all just facts. It isn't all just strife and worry. We have to be able to laugh. We have to be, we have to be able to be human. We have to be able to talk about our, our failures along with our successes and, our, and, and, and how we move forward. And, but weaving into that, it was so important to me to make sure that the central story didn't get lost. And the way we kind of chose to articulate that story, which was this investigation of, on the ground of whether why to why might work or not, was we needed some sort of a, a measure that anybody could follow. And that measure for us became the, the presence or absence of grizzly bears. Uh, you know, a wilderness dependent species, sort of an umbrella for a lot of the values and needs of other wildlife in this Rocky Mountain landscape. And you know, with the thinking that if you keep what grizzly bears need, you're gonna keep the vast majority of, of everything else. And so along the way, I kept track in my journals of where we found fresh tracks, of where we found fresh digs in the subalpine, of, of, of recently used rub trees. Uh, and of course, the sightings of the animals themselves of which we had dozens of encounters. And by the end, you know, we got up to the Yukon and I went through my notebooks and I was, I was surprised uh, as I went through of the 188 days that we were actually traveling from Yellowstone to the Yukon on the ground, there's 160 where we were seeing this fresh sign, you know, which 85% of the time. And so our message became one of hope. You know, we weren't talking about having to restore the landscape to the extent that they were trying to do for the Florida Panther, for instance, at the cost of billions of taxpayer dollars every year. You know, this was a story about designating corridors and in an effort to keep what we already have and not kind of having them being lost through the death of a thousand cuts. And so really, it was that story about hope. It was the story about the possibility for coexistence. And I think by the end, you know, we were, uh, we were kind of in our late 20s by then at the end of that journey. And it really felt like we had created this story. And, and it was kind of ours to tell. And it was the next journey, being caribou, that I think really kind of turned that around for us and made us realize, in fact, it was something else. So let's go to the being caribou journey now. Again, it had its root uh, in my day job as a park ranger. I got transferred up to the northern Yukon uh, for three seasons in a place called Avavik National Park, which is just uh, near the top here. It, it, it's bordered by the the uh, Arctic Ocean to the north and to the west, the Alaska-Yukon border. So right to the west is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge of which I think just about everybody in this room knows where that is. Um, and the reason Avavik was formed, Avavik means a uh, place where life begins in the Nuvialuit language. And the reason it was formed in cooperation between the Nuvialuit people and the Canadian federal government was to protect the Canadian portion of the porcupine caribou's calving grounds. And this really was my motivation for going up there was I w I've always wanted, since I was a boy, to experience a barren, a barren ground caribou migration. And for some of you that in the audience, I'm sure have experienced it, it is a force of nature that, is, uh, that isn't replicated by anything else because these caribou in the tens of thousands of animals, 120,000 in the case of the porcupine caribou herd. I mean, I remember the first time we saw them crossing the Porcupine River. It was an event that went on for an entire day, an entire night, and they were towing an entire Arctic ecosystem with them. You know, there were bears kind of waiting in the willows, the river crossings to ambush them. There were wolf packs flanking the herd. There was foxes in amongst the herd along with uh, eagles and hawks overhead, you know, kind of preying on the little mammals that this thundering of animals was scaring up as they, as they came across the tundra. And, and, it was, and, and what we became aware of is that we had also kind of walked into this huge conservation issue as well because 
as they were headed west out of the Yukon and into Alaska, they were heading onto this ground where 80% of them tend to calve on average every year uh, on the coastal plain of Alaska uh, that was neither protected uh, nor open for development, but there's this, this decades old debate about whether to drill for oil. And so Leanne and I kind of came back from that first time of experiencing the migration to where the office of the park was in a, uh, a community that's a two hour flight away called Inuvik. And we started looking at this from the perspective of how could we do something similar as we had done with Y to Y, uh, but for the caribou in this instance. Because as it turns out, their core calving habitat, which is in the dark green near the top of that map, overlaps almost directly with these unprotected, what are called the 1002 lands. But in all the stories that we read, in all the documentaries that we viewed about it, uh, it, was, it was never articulated what the value of this place was from the caribou's perspective. I mean, it, it had definitely been boiled down to, you know, the, the, the billions of dollars to be made, the millions of uh, barrels of oil to be gained, the thousands of jobs, but it, it, it was never articulated from the caribou's perspective. So we started thinking, you know, how could you, uh, how could you capture that? How, what is the value of this place from the perspective of these animals who have been doing this migration for 27,000 years? And what we came to realize is we could maybe capture that value by bringing alive the story of everything they go through to get to those calving grounds and back again in a typical year. You know, the river crossings, the hundreds of miles, the snow drifts, the hordes of bugs, the wolf packs that they have to uh, dodge along the way, the grizzly bear ambushes, and all those things, the blizzards. And so it too was a, a pretty intense journey. I mean, we're talking about a place that has no bridges, it has no roads, it has no pipelines. All the trails we were following are trails that have been carved into this landscape by the animals themselves. The, these, the blizzards that would come off the Arctic Ocean were completely foreign to us, you know, a place with no trees, no shelter, where we had grown up, and we would be lie awake all night just braced against the poles of our tent for fear that this, this sh meager nylon shelter was going to shred, and we would have no shelter for the remainder of the trip. And then uh, during the stage of the migration in spring, before we get to the calving grounds, the fact that all these grizzly bears started coming out of their dens and the landscape is still very snowy, uh, it's still very frozen, and there's not a lot to eat, and we pretty soon realized that, you know, we were doing this pretty ridiculous thing. We were going to the, the calving grounds with a bunch of hungry grizzly bears following the same animals for slightly different reasons than us. And for those of you that have read the book, you know how that kind of led to, to us be pushed mentally at times uh, where we t very much were considering abandoning an entire trip. And, and that kind of uh, extreme, those extreme elements, uh, the fact that this was a trip where we couldn't make a plan ahead of time because uh, the caribou, where they migrate, when they leave from one year to the next changes. I mean, they take a different mountain range from one year to the next. So there was a, a total lack of predictability there right from the beginning. And we had to give up our human agendas, our human plans, and completely yield and surrender to the whims of these wild animals. And so sometimes that would mean, although we know we had to go north to the calving grounds, if we got up in the morning and the caribou were heading south, we would head south and just follow them in their uh, wanderings, uh, knowing that hopefully, eventually, it would head north again. <laughs> and so that coupled with this incredible intensity of life, this, this life force sweeping across the landscape with such a power and instinct and rush, uh, I think those things all pushed us mentally to places and spiritually to places we had never gone before, places we'd never kind of been pushed to uh, on the Y to Y journey, for instance. And I think this little film clip for people that weren't able to attend the film screening last night, this little film clip, which is at the end of the first week of the trip, really captures that sense of we're being swept up in something very, very, uh, big, a lot bigger than ourselves uh, really captures it.
It's incredible. I mean, here we are in the middle of one of the most beautiful landscapes in the world, and then all quiet, not a sound, no jets, no planes, nothing. And then just this huge wave of life coming over and you're seeing an age old relationship play out right before your eyes. It's just, uh, it's unbelievable. And it's, I don't know, at times like this, you just feel part of something a lot larger. Well, that kind of pushing and pulling that the caribou were sending us across there went on for six weeks until we got to the calving grounds. And then we finally arrive. We're over the Yukon and Alaska border here. We're on the 1002 lands. And all of a sudden, we realize that these animals that have been pretty accepting of our presence up until then, now as they're starting to give birth, we can't do so much as even get out of our tent. So we became hostages for 10 days and 10 nights uh, uh, in our tent, literally having to pee in our cups uh, as these caribou gave birth around us. And the hundreds of caribou turned into thousands, which then turned into over 10,000 caribou uh, giving birth all around us in our tent. <clears throat> and that of itself, I think, sort of sent us to uh, a different way of being, you know, a sense of sort of quietness and inactivity and almost a meditation as we're immersed in this age-old rebirth of the herd. And then and then it was as if a switch went off 10 days later and it was time for the caribou to move. And what that switch was is this, this place that it's, was perfect in every way for those two weeks for them to give birth had now changed. So the, the, it had heated up to the extent that uh, this oasis away from bugs because of the cool breezes coming off the Arctic Ocean now was warm enough and the bugs were emerging and it was time to head into the mountains as fast as possible. And, and get up on the ridges where they could farm the slightest wind. And then when the wind really picked up, they could come out down into the valley bottoms and feed. And this is a time of year when they don't walk, they're racing. They're racing into those mountains. And the reason being is it's not just mosquitoes harassing them, but it's the bot flies that burrow up their noses. It's the warble flies that burrow under their skin, extremely painful uh, for the animals. And so all of a sudden, Leanne and I, after, you know, Two months of getting to the calving grounds, being exhausted, 10 months of sort of enforced inactivity, and now it's kind of the switch is thrown and we're literally having to try to jog with packs that weigh anywhere from 60 to 80 pounds. And it was impossible. It was impossible to keep up with the herd at that pace. And what we realized was the only thing we had to work with to try to do so, because this was the most dramatic phase of the migration, was to play with how much we didn't rest. And so instead of trying to get your standard sort of six of, to eight hours of rest in a 24 hour cycle because it was light uh, throughout the day and night, we just would nap for a half hour at a time, wake up and then head off uh, through the night with a herd trying to keep up and then nap for a half hour, an hour in the morning and then head off and continue with the herd. And this cycle of activity over and over and eating on the fly, drinking on the fly, camping in places where no matter where you pitch the tent, the smell of caribou urine would be the smell that kind of came up as you drifted off to sleep from the ground. Every mouthful of food that you're eating has caribou hair in it. In your sleeping bag is filled with caribou hair and the immersion is complete because now the animals don't care whether we're there or not. They are so consumed by getting out of the bugs it's as though we don't exist. So constantly it's this flow of animals right around us. And it was in this state of, of sort of frenzied activity of discombobulation about what was day or night, whether we were eating breakfast, lunch, or dinner, that it was as if the line between the waking world and the dream world, the line between being caribou and being human really started to blur for us. And we started to have these dreams that... Uh, would give us the sense of deja vu uh, a couple hours or maybe a day later. And we learned to actually realize that we were starting to dream where the caribou were whenever we lost them. And that kind of almost like a sixth or seventh dimension of knowledge or wisdom we were actually starting to access became more important than where we were physically seeing prints on the ground or where the biologists kind of had guessed on their maps were the most likely caribou routes. And, and then we had this, this sound that I talk about in the book called thrumming. 
And it was a sound that the caribou made, I believe, amongst themselves to communicate, much like elephants would do as they're communicating across Africa to align their movements over vast distances. And it was like a sound like sort of running water over rocks if you, when you're camping by a river, almost a, a melody or a, a, a singing. And the sound, it was there, I believe, right from the beginning when the caribou were in big groups, but we didn't hear it. It took months before we had sort of shed all those layers that we have to have up around ourselves in a world full of distractions before our senses had sharpened to the extent, before our wildness had sort of re-emerged and we were able to hear these subtleties on the edge of human hearing at a, almost an infrasonic level. And so we would wake up from some of these naps and instead of just kind of racing off in the last seen direction for the caribou that had most, uh, almost always disappeared while we were having our naps, we would just turn to each other and stop after we'd packed up and we would just listen. And I mean, we would listen in ways that we had never listened before. And then after a few moments, we kind of turned to each other and we'd say, yeah, I, I, think they're, I think it's coming from somewhere over there. And then we would shoulder our packs. We would walk over one, two, sometimes three ridges. But invariably, it would never be long before we would then happen upon the herd again. And I know, you know, for those of you that had a chance to interact with Randall when he was here last week. Uh, he is a very prominent character at the beginning and the end of the trip. But he's also there, and some of the Gwich'in stories that he shared with us just before we left uh, were there throughout the journey as well. And one of them was of a time when people could talk to caribou and caribou could talk to people. And when Randall first shared this with us, you know, it was still Karsten Hoyer the scientist, the sort of son of German immigrants, the guy who'd grown up in the city of Calgary there listening, and it was like, well, okay, I mean, that's interesting, but that's your sort of Gwich'in worldview, and we have ours. You know, I never said that, but that's what was going through my mind. And yet here we were five months later, and it was as if those two worldviews, through the power of the landscape itself, through the power of this herd itself, those two worldviews had aligned. And that really kind of hit home for me when we finally came into the village of Old Crow after being out for five months. And this is Randall's home village. You know, it's, you can only get there by flying in or traveling by boat or for walking for many weeks from the nearest road. Uh, it's a village of about 350 people. Uh, and, and it's right along the caribou's migration route uh, for the same reason that Randall's ancestors established camps there hundreds and thousands of years ago. And so you go into this community and every fence is sort of strung with caribou antlers and made more of bone than wood. And behind every house, there's a smokehouse uh, with haunches of caribou meat there. And talk on the street is all about caribou. Despite, you know, they all have high-speed internet, satellite television. They own and run the biggest aviation company in all of the Yukon. And so these are people who are fully immersed in the modern world while still maintaining this all-important connection to the land itself by way of the caribou. And so Leanne and I, we didn't have any of these slides, we didn't have any of the film ready, uh, but we just got up in this community after coming back after a couple days and gave a presentation in the community hall. And most of the community showed up, everything from the tiniest babies to the oldest men and women. And as we're talking and sharing our experiences of what had happened to us, and I mean, we didn't hold back, we were completely raw. And we just told it as we had experienced it, including the dreams, including the thrumming. We noticed all these big witching hunters in the back, these guys with sort of blackened faces from being out constantly, started to weep. And we just kept going. And at the end, some of them came up, kind of rubbing their eyes and wiping at the, away the tears. And they said, the reason we're crying is partly the stories you're telling but more importantly, it's the way you're telling them. It's the very way you're stringing together your words, the rhythm of your sentences. We haven't heard anybody speak like that since our great-grandparents came off the land. And I think right then for Leanne and I, it was this realization that, you know, we were not creators of this story. The caribou were kind of just living this story, and this story itself was embedded in the land. 
And this was so empowering, not just for us, but for the Gwich'in people. To see two outsiders who were urbanites, essentially, come and five months later emerge from this landscape talking like their ancestors. And to me, it was one of the most important moments in my life to know that those stories and that way of being exists in the land, and that can be the source of our wisdom and our way of being, our, our knowledge, the source of everything. So that, these are all things I grappled with during the course of the writing of the book, this sort of processing of the journey and trying to pull meaning out of it. And uh, by the time I was done writing the book, I really wanted to share it with, I, we were kind of in this search for an elder ourselves within our own culture. Because despite everything that had happened to us up north and amongst the Gwich'in and the incredible bonds we felt with Randall and many of his family and friends, we were still outsiders. They were, we, we were not born of that culture. But what culture are we born of? I mean, that's the question we went back home with. And what we realized, we, we, we kind of had to create our own culture for ourselves. We had to build up these elements that Western society has kind of done away with that tie us back to place, that tie us back to meaning. And so we, you know, the best sort of elder I could think of was Farley Mowat, this guy whose work had influenced and shaped me, whose values uh, and storytelling skill were really all, fulfilled all those elements of what an elder is in a culture, uh, a way of embodying and sharing their wisdom. And so I sent the manuscript for being caribou to him, not knowing him from Adam and having to send it by way of his publisher, just as you might if you decided to do the same thing, really not expecting an answer back. And uh, he was in his late 80s at the time. And I really didn't expect an answer at all. Uh, and just to give you a bit of a retrospect of some of his work, some of his most, he's written over 40 books, Owls in the Family, Lost in the Barrens, Never Cry Wolf, which went on to become a Disney movie, A Whale for the Killing, People of the Deer. I mean, I think a lot of you are probably familiar with some of his works. He's probably one of Canada's most uh, well-known and successful writers. And, and I didn't really expect an answer back. I mean, he must have been a busy guy. And, but, and you're not meant to read this. Uh, I mean, you can if you can, if your eyes are good enough. But this is the letter we got back, hammered out on a manual typewriter which is still the way Farley writes today at 91 years old. You know, he doesn't have a computer in his house, and he does everything multiple times uh, manually in the old way. And so he wrote this great letter back saying he loved the book, and he followed it up with a phone call uh, a week later saying, with an invitation saying, we've got a lot to discuss. You guys got to come visit. And turns out he lives on the opposite side of, the, of Canada. He lives on the East Coast. We're very much in the western part of the country. And I think he really imagined we would hop on a plane or maybe come by vehicle uh, and cover the 5,000 miles to his house that way. But the more Leanne and I thought about it, and the more we thought about where Farley was in his life, nearing the end of it, and what his life had meant to so many people, including ourselves, we thought, how could we pay tribute to that? How could we go and visit Farley Mowat in a way that really respected all the things that he's valued and been a proponent of all these years. And so we thought about all those things of people moving slowly and deliberately and developing a relationship with the land around them uh, because of the way they live. And we started to look at a map of Canada and realize we could canoe. We could make our way mostly by, by water course from one side of the country to the other and, and visit as many of the settings of his stories as we could along the way. And as we did, communicate with him by letter and share you know, what we were learning and realizing about these places decades after he had gone there. And so that was the idea. And meanwhile, something had changed in our lives. Uh, we had a son, Zev, who's now eight. He was, at the time, two. And uh, when we first proposed this idea to my parents, I'll never forget, my dad immediately said, I'm going to call up social services if you guys do that <laughs> to protect my son. And yet Leanne and I and Zev, along with our dog Willow, we, you know, by virtue of where we live and by virtue of what we stand for and, and, and live for, we were constantly 
taking him out on weekend trips, on week-long trips, uh, right from when he was born. And he did fine on those. And we started thinking, you know, the hardest part of these journeys is in the leaving. Once you're going, it really isn't that different from an overnight trip if you're out for five months. So why not go with a, with, with, with a two-year-old here? And so off we went. And uh, this is the, the second day leaving from just coming out of the mountains, out of Canmore, headed towards Calgary as we head east into the prairies. And it was a tough journey. And it was a journey that went through a variety of environments. You know, uh, we used a variety of modes of travel. This is us heading off to the uh, mail station in downtown Calgary to send our first letter to Farley. There was a lot of upstream travel. There was two weeks of going upstream on the Cochrane River in northern Manitoba before we got up into the Northern Territories. Uh, there was more portages than I can remember. And uh, the bugs were an order of magnitude worse than anything we'd experienced with the caribou in the Yukon. And Zev did do fine through all of it. I mean, he thrived, quite frankly. And as any of you know, with kids in nature, I mean, there was no need for toys. The smallest things from the frogs and insects completely uh, enraptured him. And every campsite was a new playground that he would explore and, 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 and use his imagination to, to uh, entertain himself. But the most magical part of the trip for all of us, I think, were these moments where as we're going across the country, we're in the settings of Farley's books, we're rereading those books, and we're having these crossover moments uh, in modern times, decades later. And probably, you know, one of the, uh, one of the first and, and certainly one of the most memorable ones was not that long after we'd started and we're in the prairies, we're in the settings uh, of books like Owls and the Family and Born Naked. This is the landscape where Farley grew up and had and enjoyed a tremendous amount of freedom as a kid exploring the, the river valleys of the prairies. And, uh, and he, he actually came upon these orphaned owls and took them home and raised them uh, in the city of Saskatoon. And so we're just sort of starting to enter that landscape and we're, we're camping in many of the cottonwood groves along the South Saskatchewan River that Farley describes in these books. And the snow of the cottonwoods is, is kind of raining down. And uh, I'll just let this little sequence from the film uh, speak for itself of what happened next. <laughs> food cash, which is great. Right on, first letter. Greetings, voyagers. We've just arrived at Brick Point by car, alas, and are getting settled in. So this will be a hectic note since it must be in the mail today. If it's to reach you at your next halt. Willow looks like the reincarnation of mine. They could be brother and sister. This could be the dog that would be. Hearing your stories reminds me of so much, especially now that I'm writing my autobiography. We're on parallel journeys, it seems to me. Me in a chair, you in a canoe. I really wish I was with you, for it was on the prairies where I had the most evocative experiences of my life. I'll never forget how it felt. A place without walls, a being in an open, unfettered world. Dear Farley, thanks for your May 25th letter sent to Leader Saskatchewan. The trip is going exceedingly well. Now that we're a month into it, the rhythms of the river have pushed aside the clutter that otherwise crowds our heads. And just the other night, while sitting in the crook of a cottonwood tree with Zev in my lap, in my a lap. huge great horned a owl huge answered our great call. horned owl answered our call. Was it a coincidence? that I dug out my childhood copy of Owls in the Family 
and started reading it the evening before? That couldn't possibly have been a coincidence. contact. God bless you. I heard somebody in the front here say whiskey at the end. But it was actually cranberry and orange juice or, or cranberry and vodka. This is Farley's favorite drink now. <laughs> So that was on the prairies, uh, sort of jumping way ahead here up north. We actually found the remnants of the cabin where Farley uh, based himself in 1947 and 1948 on New Elton Lake, uh, where he had the experiences that became the subject of, of uh, Never Cry Wolf, People of the Deer, and, uh, and a host of other stories. And we were able to actually use a copy of Never Cry Wolf on our laps as we're canoeing across the lake that directed us through his description to the sand esker and find uh, the, the, the esker that was used for wolf denning. And although, I mean, we made sure that it wasn't active before, <laughs> right now, and it wasn't active this year, but there certainly was enough bones and so on around to suggest it had been very active in years past. And we, you know, we were a little bit disappointed that it wasn't active now, and yet that evening, uh, as we're setting up camp not far away, uh, this uh, Arctic wolf, uh, which matched almost to the T the description of Angeline, the uh, alpha female in Never Cry Wolf, comes trotting past, uh, past through our camp. And then uh, another example was, you know, this, again, this is sort of jumping uh, over a month ahead once we'd made our way to Hudson Bay and then down uh, into Southern Canada again in the Maritimes and kind of into the final chapter of Farley's life uh, and managed to sail across the St. Lawrence Gulf and then into the Cabot Strait uh, and onto the southwest coast of Newfoundland. And this is where, this is a place called Burgio where Farley and his wife Claire lived for six years and it's the setting of A Whale for the Killing. And what happened in A Whale for the Killing was a fin whale chasing herring at the spring tide, the highest tide of the month, uh, came in over the shallow little gut of the lagoon, chasing the herring. The tide dropped, and this whale was then trapped in this lagoon for the next month. And so we took the dinghy from the sailboat, rowed into that lagoon, and read some of the passages from Farley's book. And literally, you could almost sort of hear the rifle fire ricocheting off the cliff because as many of you probably know it's a story about sort of half the community kind of wanting to persecute this poor trapped whale and then the other half trying to save it and quite a tragic story and we didn't hear or see uh, any actual fin whales in fact the people in Burgio had uh, made no bones about it we were very unlikely to see any fin whales in the area because it just wasn't a time of year when you saw fin whales, and besides the point, over the last 10 years, they hardly saw fin whales at any time of the year around here. And yet, uh, after spending a week in the area and sort of setting sail again up the Cabot Strait, uh, no sooner are we underway than we see these spouts uh, up ahead. And this is literally within 10 miles of the community of Burgio. And so we kind of yarded over on the tiller, uh, drifted over, dropped the sails, and for the next half hour, we're surrounded by this pod of fin whales. And we didn't, you know, we sort of shared all these overlapping moments with Farley during the course of the journey. But this last one, we didn't have to write a letter because we were just days from Farley Mowat's house. And so this was one of the things we could actually share with him in person once we arrived. 
And like all pilgrimages, you know, the, a lot of the questions we'd left with about, you know, where do stories reside? Where's the wisdom? Is it available in our own culture, you know, uh, accessible, much like it became accessible to us in the Gwich'in culture on the Caribou trip? You know, these were all questions we left with, but by the time we got actually to Farley's house, all those questions had kind of been answered by the land itself. And so what did we learn from Farley by the time we arrived there? Well, this is Canada's most successful writer. He sold over 14 million books worldwide. Uh, you know, he could be a very rich man, and yet he lives very simply. Uh, I mean, he greeted us on the beach in this old ratty raincoat. He drives a, a, a Ford Ranger single cab that's over 20 years old. Uh, his house is this old clapboard farmhouse with kind of worn furniture inside, very comfortable, very homey, but nothing special. And, and to go up into his writing studio, you know, you, you realize that Canada's most successful writer, his writing desk is, you can't, maybe you can see it, but it's these old sawhorses and an old door on top of it. His, his chair is more duct tape than anything else. His, his filing cabinet is a cardboard box there you can see on the desk. And, and yeah, there's nothing, this footstool is one of those milk crates. I don't know if you have them in Alaska, but you know, as university students, those were our bookshelves that we stole from behind 7-Elevens. And there's nothing pretentious about this. There's nothing inaccessible. There's nothing special. There's nothing that would be any different from, from you know, being a university student. And this storytelling, this vocation, this desire that drives Farley to still go and write every morning in his 80s and early 90s now uh, is, is the fire that keeps him going. It's sort of an un, in, unextinguishable fire. And that to me was the big, the big message, I guess, is that here's a man who's, who continues to be driven who, for whom stories is the most important thing. And, and those stories that had spoken to us, him, much like they spoke to us, he just felt an obligation to continue to tell those stories and share them as an agent for change in the world. But there was this one thing that I just had to ask Farley about. It was this uh, up above his head there. You can barely see there's this diagram uh, about this big uh, hanging over his desk. And this is a close-up of that diagram. And I kind of stared at it. And finally I said, Farley, like, what the heck is this all about? And he says, you know, when you're writing, when you're telling those stories, and, or you're trying, and it just stops. Like you just can't put a thought that's coherent on the page. And then every once in a while they're just flying out of your head and your fingers can't keep up on the keyboard. He says, one day I just became totally convinced it had something to do with how I was sitting. <laughs> so what I did was when it was just flying out of my mind, I stopped everything, I got the ruler out, and I made all the measurements. <laughs> and so now whenever I'm blocked, I stop, I get up, I get the ruler out, and I make sure that I'm sitting just right. <laughs> and I kind of looked at him and... He said, and you know that's bullshit, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> because all this is really demands is sitting down and making it work and trying over and over again and trying to circle in to that elusive point of truth that I think we're all constantly trying to circle in and, and tell, no matter the medium. Uh, so just before we end here, I'm just going to ask Leanne to sort of jump up onto the stage and talk about uh, the latest medium, the, the kind of last little necessary journey that uh, she's taken uh, over the last few months. Okay, this is definitely shifting gears from typewriters. I'll, I'll tell you that much. Fair 71. As you can see, a lot of our journeys have really evolved one after another in a fairly organic way. And I would say that's definitely the case with this, this as well. Um, and it all started uh, basically after the Finding Farley film was out in the world. And I was sort of s sniffing around trying to think what the next project would be. And in, in the meantime, the National Film Board of Canada had gotten really interested in new media projects. And I don't know how many 
people have seen amazing films at a festival or whatever, and you say to your friends, but I have no idea how you're ever gonna find that film. And I think that's part of the excitement around new media is that the accessibility, it's one click away from sharing with your friends. And I wasn't necessarily intrigued by that, but I still, you know, sort of looked at some of the projects that they were excited about. And one of them was called The Whale Hunt, and it was by uh, Jonathan Harris. And he went up to Barrow, Alaska and documented a whale hunt, and no matter what, took a photograph every five minutes. So at the end of this hunt, he had over 5,000 photographs. And so when you go onto that site, you just see these tiny icons of that, those 5,000 images all spill onto the screen. And then as a viewer, you can decide how you're gonna experience that narrative of the hunt from the perspective of the whale, the hunters, and so on. And right when I saw that, the light bulb went on about these photographs that we've been exposed to over many years that have been taken for research purposes around Banff National Park, that we'd, we'd always been intrigued by them. And it was just like, okay, I think I have a hunch that we have a way to tell this story finally. But I really didn't know what it was for sure. But I basically um, went to the head of the digital program at the National Film Board in Vancouver, had no appointment and just, um, tried to get this guy's ear and I literally did an elevator pitch with them in the elevator with my laptop in my my hand and I just showed him these photographs and told them that there were probably a million of these things that we had access to and I thought there was there was something in them and I thought we we had a story to tell I wasn't sure what it was And I think what has always fascinated us about them is that there, there is no person behind the lens framing the image. And it really, it feels like it's kind of capturing nature uninterrupted. This one's quite dark, but incredibly, this is a couple of grizzly bears fighting on one of those overpasses that you saw Carson show the image of going over the Trans-Canada Highway. This is an image, that, again, that one's kind of dark. This is, uh, takes, yeah, this, this cougar was going in a, under an underpass about five kilometers from our house. So it really makes you kind of see the landscape differently. It's an incredible image of a golden eagle. And so, the, yeah, this one's one of my favorites. This is a, a yearling grizzly bear seeing snow for the very first time. <laughs> Just watching it come down. So I spent, I basically just got a small grant to pour through thousands and thousands of these images. And um, what I found going through them was that once I sort of came out of my haze of looking at my computer, I saw the landscape around where we live in a totally different way. And it kind of felt like it was coming full circle back to you know, our experiences with the caribou or on these journeys that that, that was going on right outside my door, but I was missing it because I was sitting behind my computer. And I really tried to hold on to that through the process and, and somehow bring that into the story. But I really struggled to figure out what the heck the story was gonna be. But I realized that sometimes we actually knew these individual animals and we knew their life stories. And in fact, with Bear 71, because she was colored at the age of three, and basically watched every single day of her life, I could go through stacks and stacks of notes about, you know, I knew the amount, the number of cubs she had, who her mates were, you know, what her habits were. And she was this amazing bear that just seemed to have figured out how to live in this area where it's the most developed landscape in the world where grizzly bears still exist. So I honed in on that story to try and tell her the story of her life and but it was still a matter of how are we gonna tell the story of this bear? And it was, this is a time-lapse um, image. There's a, a train that's just spilled a whole pile of grain there. And fortunately this bear wasn't hit in that clip, but that's a bit of foreshadowing about the story of Bear 71. But it was interesting to go through this process with the National Film Board. They were terrified of telling a story that would seem at all like a National Geographic story or sort of a typical nature story. And, and I didn't necessarily want to do that either because this material was so unique. And when I was watching that particular sequence one day, I started to imagine what Bear 71 
might be thinking, what might be going through her mind. And so I actually gave her a voice. And so we decided that we would take this leap and we were basically telling this, she was telling the story of her life as a dead bear looking back at it. So we decided to put no limits on what she would know. She would be this omniscient bear. She would know what drugs she was shot with when she was collared. She would know about GPS. She would know about everything. But she was also a wild bear. And so she could be kind of this bridge between that wildness and then this very short period of time where we've had this incredible explosion of technology and in a way kind of make fun of us in that whole thing and oh that's I think I went back there but then um, we had this issue of it being a totally new medium to me it wasn't as if I could just use the tools to create a film so I had to pair up with someone at the National Film Board in order to figure out how to create this thing online and so it, the fellow I co-created this, Jeremy Mendez, he was super excited about all this imagery as well. But when he looked at it, he, and he's from the city of Vancouver, he said, this looks a lot like the pictures that were just taken of me at the bank machine or the 7-Eleven. Like these are surveillance photos. And isn't it strange that we're looking at nature through that same kind of lens? And he really felt like this was a story about technology. And so there was a, the really difficult part of this for me was that um, building one of these projects is much like building a house. Everything's on paper and you can't actually see it like a film. And so he had these ideas of that people would have their webcams and you'd see these surveillance walls. And meanwhile, I'm thinking of this, you know, emotional story about a bear. I was, this, I was thinking it, it could never work. But as it turned out, Jeremy's ideas, and he, he came up with this, you know, this backdrop is, is sort of the technological interpretation of Bear 71's world. And so when you go on this site, it's like um, Sarah said, it's a 20 minute experience. There are three pieces of video that basically come up automatically in the beginning, middle and end. But in between, you just roam around this world and push on all these different icons and then you get to see some of this imagery that's, that I poured through and um, sort of curated for it. And I think what it did is it, it's, this project has uh, reached a massive urban audience. It's, it's reached a young audience. It recently won a Khan Award for creativity. You know, it won an award down in Jackson Hole recently as a, um, a new media project. And so I think that combination of our, our ideas really made it stronger in the end. And this, this particular sequence I wanted to bring up because for me, what I felt like I had to kind of relent on a lot of this technology that was crashing into this story and in the end made it better. But I also wanted to point out how there are things that we're, I think, missing when we're so beholden to technology. And one thing is just how these um, rub trees are, yeah, I mean, they're, these bears are absolutely in love with these trees. You gotta wonder what, what's going on there. I'll never forget the first rub tree we saw when we came back to tree line on the caribou trip. It might as well have been in neon. You know, it was just so obvious that this was a major thing that absolutely every animal was gonna check out. And yet now, when you go through any typical trail in Banff, sometimes it's, you know, you'll pass 40 rub trees and not even know it. And I think this is the kind of subtle knowledge that we would have always understood. And maybe we would have checked out those trees that we're, we're kind of losing because of technology. But obviously it's allowing us to appreciate it too. So it's, it's not a black and white thing. And I think the, you know, this, the, these cameras have made us actually value some of these places even more. And you can see that, yeah, just about every animal will pass by one of these trees. And the, the, th the thing is, is there's information on the trees from the last you know, hour, the last day, but there's also sometimes from the last century that there's, there's information on the trees. So it's, I think I just kind of wanted to end with this sequence just because it's so fun. And also, um, just I think this is the kind of thing that's, that's um, sort of what we're searching for in the kinds of projects that we, we continue to take on. Thanks. <laughs>
Well, thanks so much. Uh, I, it's been a, a great privilege to be here and to share this wisdom that we've been privileged to kind of stumble upon, upon ourselves. And I think one of the most uh, powerful parts of being here over the last three days has been the ability to uh, talk about some of these things, uh, not just with the student body, but also with the significant Aboriginal student body here at UAS. And to sort of come, much like we did with Randall, to realize that although we have these very different cultural backgrounds, there's just this sort of base level of being human uh, that we all have access to, of being humans in this sort of beautiful, uh, richly tapestried world. So with that, we'll, we'll end. And uh, Sarah, should we just open it up to a few questions? Great. Sure, yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we'll open up to questions. And we have R Rochelle. Yeah, Rochelle here is going to run a mic. And I do ask you, before you uh, start speaking, make sure you have the mic in your hand because tonight's being recorded and it's nice to document that as well. So, no yeah, and no pressure. Are there any, are there any questions? <laughs> I'm interested in the in the animal crossings uh, over the over the highways, and just wanted to know: is there any research that's valid? Are, are you seeing less road kills, for instance? Is that? And, and I know they're working. I, I think from the cameras and whatnot, you're actually seeing the animals are because it was a guess, wasn't it? I mean, the whole thing, whether this was really going to take, whether they, you know, would the animals really utilize it, and and it apparently it, it did, and it is. Yeah, I'll, Leanne's just finished a little uh, sort of mini documentary about it, so I'll let her answer this. Yeah, it just very, I'm, well, it's not quite done. I'm, I'm just putting the finishes, finishing touches on a 22-minute documentary called Highway Wilding, and it's just for that reason to get this incredible success story out in the world about the crossing structures in Banff. Yeah, there's been a over 98% decrease in ungulate mortality because of those crossing structures. I mean, it's not a perfect system. It's not completely impermeable to, say, wolves, and, and there's some problem areas with, with bears, but overall, it's been an overwhelming success. In fact, the film ends with, last fall, the very first wolverine to use one of these overpasses oh, wow. crossed cross, so I mean, a wolverine, one of the most secretive and elusive animals on the planet, if they can adapt to these things, then I think pretty much any animal can. And I mean, it's one thing to get these things built in Banff National Park, but we do profile another highway system that's south of Banff, that's all the same issues exist. And what they've been able to show, actually, is that you, they've been able to put a value, like a cost, basically, to like every deer that's hit is about $6,000, an elk is $15,000, a moose is $30,000. So if you have, you know, your cumulative costs of insurance, health care, all those kinds of things, that if you hit a certain number of animals in a certain stretch of highway, you're, it's actually cost, it's a cost benefit to have the, the fencing and underpasses. So it's kind of a win-win-win. It's good for the animals, it's safer for people, and it's actually of economic benefit. So that's exactly why I've done this film, to kind of get that story. And it's actually, there's a version of it that's touring with the Banff Mountain World Tour right now. So we're hoping to really get that story out. Because it's needed in Colorado, it's needed in Montana, all those kinds of places. And, and you know, I, I can't imagine there's a road busy enough. I mean, I'm sure there are issues here as well. Yeah. Build it and they will come. <laughs> How have you been able to develop the flexibility in your lifestyle of having to work and support yourself to go out and do these, these trips like this? You have to tell your secrets now. <laughs> <laughs> With great difficulty. Um, yeah, and this, this came up with the students as well. Uh, it's been a real mix. Uh, we, I have maintained my seasonal work six months a year as a park ranger, and that really has been the mainstay financially. Of That's the most sort of secure thing we've had. Um, and then we've sort of had these feast or famine times where uh, you, know, you secure a book deal and an advance comes in, 
and then you kind of don't see anything else for months or even years after that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it has, there has been no formula, quite, quite frankly. And it's, you know, friend has joked that we live in this way where it's sort of three months out and cliffs on all sides. <laughs> and, you know, having a child obviously kind of puts yet another bit of pressure on, on, on that kind of a lifestyle. Uh, but we've also tried to live quite simply and uh, to keep our costs at a minimum. And, uh, yeah, sort of do all sorts of, I, I do biological consulting contracts, sometimes a little bit of magazine writing, sell some photographs. Leanne's dibble and dabbling in guiding, uh, you know, filmmaking for the web, filmmaking for documentary, uh, doing camera work, helping co-produce a film festival locally. So, yeah, it's, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a formula. <laughs> but I, you know, it, again, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's kind of living intuitively, instinctively, in a way as well. And like, there's a, there's not, I can't say enough about that. And it's, and I told uh, one class uh, yesterday, it's just, you, you need to kind of live with yourself and where you go and what you do. And what we've always done is just kind of followed our heart and all the kind of details of life and finances and uh, how we pay for it have fallen into place afterwards. Uh, always. I mean, we left on the caribou journey having raised only enough money to, to finance two of what we figured we're going to need 10 uh, bush plane flights to give us food. And there was actually a third person involved in the trip up until that point. And that was the point where he said, forget it, I'm out of here. Like, we're, you know, you're leaving not even knowing how you're going to feed yourselves after six weeks. And yet there were enough researchers, water survey technicians, biologists, whatever, flying into that country over the course of the five months that we were out there as word got around. Uh, and they realized, you know, what we were trying to do, that support started just arriving. And all we had to pay for in the end were two flights. So, I mean, that's kind of an example, one of many examples of how things just kind of work out. That's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, uh, there's a comment in the front here that, uh, just sort of a side comment, not requiring a mic, but sort of that's Canadians for you. And and uh, in a way, you know, you kind of laugh, but there is a there is we have, as you know, a social safety net, and the worst that can happen is we end up uh, on employment insurance, and if we get sick or injured, we still have that safety net of we we can still go to the hospital and receive great medical care, and you know, I think that does sort of uh, allow a certain amount of creativity and risk taking that is a little bit more formidable if you don't have those kinds of things in place. At the beginning of your um, movie, I saw you were, and you talked about being in the trail of the caribou surrounded with the wolves and the bears. Did you ever have any, some uh, too close for comfort kind of interactions with the animals that were the predators? Well, the, yeah, there's one incident that we talk about in the film. We didn't actually film it because it was a little too scary at the time to film it, but we filmed ourselves shortly after it, it happened. And yeah, there was just this time when all the bears were emerging and we saw six, six grizzly bears in one day and this one kind of sickly old bear came right into our camp and was right nose, like definitely nosing right down into our camp. And uh, yeah, we shouted and tried tried to deter it and it didn't seem to be being deterred. We had our knives out, our bear sprays ready. And then Karsten just took the tent sort of in desperation. It was, it was half set up with one pole in it and just lunged at the bear. And that was enough to make her just kind of wander off. She didn't, she didn't sort of bolt, she just wandered away. So it was still very disconcerting. And had we been able to quit the very next day, we probably would have, it was that frightening an experience but as it turned out it would have been four days for us to even get to a place where we could um, you know be rescued and thankfully those next four days it was totally fogged in we, 
we couldn't see. There probably were bears out there, but we weren't seeing them anymore. And um, yeah, I think it just that that fear just kind of got put back into its rightful place. And, and we realized if we were really going to truly be caribou, we had to accept that. And, and we had the models of the caribou who were, you know, exposed to all the same things. And, you, you know, they, in a way, seeing that they just went about their lives and dealt with it as they needed to was a real inspiration. So, I mean, we did talk about carrying a firearm, but there was just no way with the video camera and all that kind of thing. So. Can uh, you Google Bear 71 to... Uh yeah, that's all you got to do. Bear71.nfb.ca. And like I said, it'll, it's not a film, so you'll never be able to download it. You'll never be able to buy a DVD. It's just always online. And it's what's great is it's one click away from sharing all the time and experiencing yourself. Thanks everyone for coming to the last evening, Egan. So uh, have a great night and remember that Sarah Hagen has some books to sell. And if you want Carson and Leanne to sign them, please stick around and they're, I'm sure they'll hang out and chat a little bit too. So thank you very much.